The whole episode of Miss Awful began for the Clarks at their dinner table one Sunday afternoon. Young Roger Clark was explaining why he could go to Central Park with his father instead of staying home to finish his homework. Miss Wilson, his teacher, wouldn't be at school tomorrow, so who would know the difference? She has to take care of a crisis, Roger explained. It's in Omaha. What is? His older sister, Elizabeth, inquired. For a kid in the third grade, Roger, you talk dopey. You fail to make sense. Roger ignored the insult. His sister was a condition of life he had learned to live with, like lions or snakes, poisonous ones. Teetering, as always, on the tilted back chair, feet wrapped around the legs, he continued. Till Miss Wilson gets back, we're having some other teacher. She flew to Omaha yesterday. He pushed some peas around on his plate and was silent a moment. I hope her plane don't crash, he said. Roger's mother patted his hand. A lively, outgoing youngster, as noisy and rambunctious as any eight-year-old, he had another side to him, tender and soft, which worried about people. Let the blind man who sold pencils outside the 5 and 10 on Broadway be absent from his post, and Roger worried that catastrophe had overtaken him. When Mrs. Loomis, a neighbor of the Clarks in the Greenwich Village Brownstone, had entered the hospital, Roger's anxious queries had not ceased until she was discharged. And recently, there was a cat which had nested in the downstairs doorway at night. Roger had carried down saucers of milk, clucking with concern. Is the cat run away? Don't it have a home? Virginia Clark assured her son, you'll have Miss Wilson safely back before you know it. It's nice that you care so. Roger beamed with relief. Well, I like Miss Wilson. She's fun. Last week, for instance, when Tommy Miller got tired of staying in his seat and lay down on the floor, he did what? Roger's father was roused from his post-dinner torpor. Sure. Pretty soon the whole class was lying down. Know what Miss Wilson did? If you'll notice, Mother, Elizabeth interjected, he hasn't touched a single pea. She lay down on the floor too, Roger went on ecstatically. She said we'd all have a rest. It was perfectly normal in the middle of the day. That's what I love about St. Jeff's. It's fun. Fun, snorted his sister. School isn't supposed to be a fun fest. It's supposed to be feeling that empty noodle of yours. Miss Wilson got down on the floor, Mr. Clark repeated. He had met Roger's teacher on occasion. She struck him as capable, but excessively whimsical. She was a large woman to getting, be getting down on the floors, Mr. Clark thought. What'd the class do next? He asked. Oh, we lay there for a while, then we get up and we did a Mexican hat dance, Roger answered. It was swell. <laughs> I'm sure not every day is as frolicsome, Mrs. Clark countered slightly anxious. She brought in dessert, a chocolate mousse. Roger's story sounded typical of St. Jeffrey's. Not that she was unhappy with his school, a small private institution. While it might be called excessive, overly permissive, it projected a warm, homey atmosphere, which Mrs. Clark found appealing. It was church affiliated, which she approved of and Heaven knows its location, a few blocks away from the brownstone, was convenient. True, Roger's scholastic progress was not notable. His spelling, for example, remained atrocious. Friendly as St. Jeffrey's was, Mrs. Clark sometimes did wish. Roger attacked dessert with a lot more zest than he had shown the peas. So can I go to the park with you, Dad? I've only got spelling left, and who cares about that? Before his mother could comment, he was up from the table and racing towards the coat closet. Okay, Dad? I didn't say you could go. I didn't even say I would take you, Mr. Clark objected. 
He happened at that moment to glance at his waistline and reflect that a brisk hike might do him some good. He pushed back his chair. All right, but the minute we return, it's straight to your room to finish your spelling. Ah, oh, thanks, Dad. Can we go to the boat pond first? We will not, cried Elizabeth, elbowing into the closet. We'll go to the sheep meadow first. Roger was too happy to argue. Pulling on his jacket, he remarked, Gee, I wonder what the new teacher will be like. Ready for your coat, Dad? It was just as well that he gave no, the matter no more thought. In view of events to come, Roger was entitled to a few carefree hours. Monday morning at school started off with perfect normalcy. It began exactly like any other school morning. Elizabeth had long since departed for the girls' school she attended uptown when Mrs. Clark set out with Roger for the short walk to St. Jeff's. She didn't trust him with the Fifth Avenue traffic yet. They reached the school corner, and Roger skipped away eagerly from her. The sidewalk in front of the school had already boasted a large, jostling throng of children, and his legs couldn't hurry Roger fast enough to join them. Indeed, it was his reason for getting to school promptly, to have time to play before the 845 bell. Roger's school bag was well equipped for play. As usual, he packed a supply of baseball cards for trading opportunities, a spool of string in case anybody brought a kite, a water pistol for possible use in the laboratory, and a police whistle for sheer noise value. Down the Greenwich Village sidewalk, he galloped, shouting the names of his third grade friends as he picked out faces from the throng. Hiya, Tommy. Hey, hiya, Bruce. Hi, Steve. You bring your trading cards? By the time the 845 bell rang, St. Jeffrey's used a cowbell, one of the homey touches. Roger had finished a game of tag, traded several baseball cards, and was launched in an exciting jump the hydrant contest. Miss Gillis, the school secretary, was in charge of the bell, and she had to clang it extensively before the student body took notice. Clomping up the front steps, they spilled into the downstairs hall, headed in various directions. Roger's class swarmed up the stairs in rollicking spirits. Tommy Miller, Bruce Reeves, Joey Lambert, the girls forming an untidy rear flank behind them, shrill with laughter. It wasn't until the front ranks reached the third grade classroom that the first ominous note was struck. Hey, what's going on? Jimmy Moore demanded, first to observe the changed appearance of the room. The other children crowded behind him in the doorway. Instead of a cozy semicircle, as though we're seated round a glowing hearth, Miss Wilson had described it, the desks and chairs had been rearranged into stiff, rigid rows. Gee, look, the desks are in rows, commented Midge Fuller a plump little girl who stood blocking Roger's view. Midge was a child given to unnecessary statements. It's raining today, she would volunteer to her classmates, all of them in slickers, or there's the lunch bell, gang. The point to Roger wasn't that the desks had been rearranged. The point was, why? As if in answer, he heard two hands clap behind him, as loud and menacing as thunder. What's this? What's this? Barked a stern, raspish voice. You're not cattle milling in a pen. Enough foolish gaping. Come, come form into lines. Heads turned in unison. Mouths fell agape. The children of St. Jeffrey's third grade had never formed into lines of any sort. But... This was not the cause of their shocked inertia. Each was staring, with a sensation similar to that of drowning, at the owner of the raspish voice. She was tall and straight as a ruler, and was garbed in an ancient tweed suit whose skirt dipped nearly to the ankles. She bore a potted plant in one arm and Miss Wilson's roll book in the other. Rimless spectacles glinted on her bony nose. 
Her hair was gray, like a witch's, skewered in a bun, and there was no question she had witch's eyes. Roger had seen those same eyes leering from the pages of Hansel and Gretel. Identical they were. He gulped at the terrible presence. Form lines, I said, girls in one, boys in the other. Poking, prodding, patrolling, back and forth, the new teacher needed the third grade into position and ruefully inspected the result. Sloppiest group, group I ever beheld. March! She clapped time with her hands and the stunned ranked trooped into the classroom. One, two, three. One, two. Girls on the window side, boys on the wall. Stand at your desk. Remove your outer garments. You, little miss with the vacant stare. What's your name? J, J, a voice squeaked. Speak up. I won't have mumblers. Jane, Jane Douglas? Well, Jane Douglas, you'll be the coat monitor. Collect the garments a row at a time and hang them neatly in the cloakroom. Did you hear me, child? Stop staring. Normally, slow-moving Jane Douglas became a whirl of activity, charging up and down the aisles, picking coats in her arms, piling coats in her arms. The new teacher tugged at the tweed jacket. Class be seated, hands folded on desks, she barked, and there was immediate compliance. She next paraded to the windows and installed a potted plant on the sill. Her witch's hands fussed with the green leaves straightening, pruning. Plants and children belong in classrooms, she declared, spectacles sweeping over the rows. Can someone suggest why? There was total silence, punctured by a deranged giggle, quickly suppressed. <sighs> Very well, I will tell you. Plants and children are living organisms. Both will grow with proper care. Repeat, proper. Not indulgent fawning or giving into whims scrupulously. With another tug of the jacket, she strode ruler straight to the desk in front of the room. I am Miss Orville, O-R-V-I-L-L-E, she spelled. You are to use my name in replying to all questions. In the back of the room, Jimmy Moore whispered frantically to Roger. What'd she say your name was? Miss Orville rapped her desk. Attention, please. No muttering in the back. She cleared her voice and resumed. Prior to my retirement, I taught boys and girls for 46 years, she warned. I am beyond trickery, so I advise you to try none. You are to be in my charge until the return of Miss Wilson, however long that may be. She clasped her hands in front of her and trained her full scrutiny on the rose. Since I have no knowledge of your individual abilities, perhaps a look at the weekend homework will shed some light. Miss Wilson left me a copy of the assignment. You have all completed it, I trust. Take out your notebooks, please. At once, at once, I say. Roger's head spun dizzily around. He gaped at the monstrous tweed figure in dismay. Book bags were being clipped open, notebooks drawn out. What was he to do? He had gone to his room after the outing in the park yesterday, but alas, it had not been to complete his assignment. He watched, horrified, as the tweed figure proceeded among the aisles and inspected the notebooks. What what was what she say her name was? Awful? Was that it? Miss Awful? Biting his lip, he listened to her scathing comments. You call this chicken scrawl penmanship? A page was torn out and thrust at its owner. Redo it at once. It assaults the intelligence. Then, moving on. What is this maze of ill spelled words? <laughs> Not a composition, I trust. Ill spelled words. Oh, he was in for it for sure. The tweed figure was heading down the aisle. She was three desks away, no escaping it. Roger opened his book bag. It slid from his grasp and with a crash fell to the floor. Books, pencil case spelled out, baseball cards scattered, the water pistol, the police whistle, 
the spool of string. Ah, crowed Miss Oval, instantly at his desk, scooping up the offending objects. We've come to play, have we? And she fixed her witch's gaze on him. Long before the week's end, it was apparent to Virginia Clark that something was drastically wrong with her son's behavior. The happy-go-lucky youngster had disappeared, as if down a well. Another creature had replaced him, nervous, harried, continuously glancing over his shoulder in the manner of one being followed. Mrs. Clark's first inkling of change occurred that same Monday. She had been chatting with the other mothers who congregated outside St. Jeffrey's at three every afternoon to pick up their offspring. A casual assembly. The mothers were as relaxed and informal as the school itself. Lounging against the picket fence, exchanging small talk and anecdotes. <laughs> that darling cowbell, laughed one of the group at the familiar clang. Did I tell you that Anne's class is having a taffy pull on Friday? <laughs> Where else in the frantic city of New York? The third grade was the last class to exit the building on Monday. Not only that, but Mrs. Clark noted that the children appeared strangely subdued. Some of them were actually reeling, all but dazed. As for Roger, eyes taut and pleading, he quickly pulled his mother down the block, signaling for silence. When enough distance had been gained, words erupted from him. No, we don't have a new teacher, he flared wildly. We got a witch for a new teacher. It's the truth. She's from Hansel and Gretel, the same horrible eyes. And she steals toys. Yes. He repeated in mixed outrage and hurt. By accident, you happen to put some toys in your book bag and she steals them. I'll fool her. I won't bring any more toys to school, he howled. Know what, know what children are to her? Plants. She did. She called us plants. Miss Awful, that's her name. Such was Roger's distress that his mother offered to stop at Schraff's on 13th Street and treat him to a soda. Who's got homework to do? Punishment homework. Ten words, ten times each on account of that witch's spelling test. Ten words, ten times each? Ms. Clark repeated. How many words were on the test? Ten, moaned Roger. Everyone wrong. Come on. I don't have... I gotta hurry home. I don't have time to waste. Refusing to be consoled, he headed for the brownstone and the desk in his room. On Tuesday, together with the other mothers, Mrs. Clark was astonished to see the third grade march down the steps at St. Jeffrey's in military precision. Clop, clop, the children marched, looking neither to the left nor the right while behind them came a stiff-backed, iron-haired woman in a pepper-and-salt suit. One, two, three, one, two, three, she counted, then clapped her hand in dismissal. Turning, she surveyed the assemblage of goggle-eyed mothers. May I inquire, is the mother of Je Joseph Lambert among you? she asked. I I'm Mrs. Lambert, replied a voice meekly whereupon Miss Orville paraded directly up to her. The rest of the mothers looked on speechless. Mrs. Lambert, your son threatens to grow into a useless member of society, stated Miss Orville in ringing tones that echoed down the street. That is, unless you term watching television useful. Joseph has confessed that he views three hours per evening? Only after his homework's finished. Marjorie Lambert aloud. <sighs> Madame, he does not finish his homework. He idles through it, scattering mistakes hidly piggly. I suggest you give him closer supervision. Good day. With a brief nod, Ms. Orville proceeded down the street, and it was a full moment before the other mothers had recovered enough to comment. Some voted in favor of immediate protest to Dr. Jameson. St. Jeffrey's headmaster, on the hiring on such a woman, even on a temporary basis. But since it was temporary, the mothers concluded it would have to be tolerated.